Can the CTMU explain leptogenesis? Excuse me? Can the CTMU explain leptogenesis? So Leptogenesis? Yeah. You got me on that one. There's a disparity between matter and antimatter. And one of the propositions is there's something called leptogenesis, which accounts for this asymmetry. Right. Yeah. Uh, can, can the CTMU explain? Well, let's just put it this way. If it cannot be explained within the CTMU, then it cannot be explained. The CTMU is called a TOE for a reason. Okay? It's comprehensive. All right, so if this distinction is valid, and it is, because we know that both matter and antimatter exist, then it has to be ex explicable in the CTMU. Would you consider the CTMU to be more of a definition than a theory? It's both a definition and a theory. Okay, it's the self-definition of reality. Reality must define itself. Okay, but it does that in the form of a language, the metaphorical language we were speaking about earlier, and it takes the form of a theory. Okay, in other words, every theory, every theory, you know, technically, it's not just a theory; it's a theoretical language. That's what a that's what a logician or a, or, a, or, a, or a model theorist would call it. It's a kind of language. So it has that structure. Getting back to this background independent place. There's a question here about if this coincides with Einstein and Mach. Einstein and Mach had this idea of. Sorry, I'm sure you've heard of Mach's principle. Yes. Okay. What does the CTMU have to say about Mach's principle, and is it related to this intrinsic background? All right. Maybe I better ask what your formulation of Mach's principle. Sure, sure, sure. It's strange that. We can feel rotation when we do so, and it seems as if it's related by the distribution of matter far away, like there's an actual background. So yes. now if there's an intrinsic background in the CTMU, does that mm -hmm. serve as some basis for Mach's principle? Yes. Well, the, you're actually coupled with your background. That's one thing that you see in the theory of relativity. Basically, the medium is given some kind of separate structure, separate from the content of the medium. But you actually have to couple those two things. Relativity would make no sense at all if you didn't. So, you know, as far as being able, inertia and being able to feel, that you're talking about angular momentum and, and, and you know, inertia, uh, basically those two things are a function of that coupling, the way you are, the way you are coupled to your environment. Like I said, this is how the CTMU quantizes things, in these, uses these dual couplings to do that. And of course, but that's all intrinsic. I mean, keep in mind that's all intrinsic. There's nothing external to the universe. So if you're going to talk about the universe rotating in some external medium, that's not valid. Okay, the rotation, for all rotation is intrinsic. And the way it can be intrinsic is because you're formulating it as a coupling of it and its content. And you're actually making, you're actually introducing some kind of angular momentum between them. That's intrinsic. And of course, as you know, the theory of relativity is is our major intrinsic theory of physics. It's intrinsic, based on intrinsic geometry and so forth. Mm -hmm. I also heard you talk about the fact that the universe is expanding. Is It's a strange concept because what is it expanding into? However, I think that physicists do a disservice by saying that the universe is expanding. It's more about the metric is changing. So now, let's imagine... That that's what the statement is. The metric is changing. So what's the problem with that statement? And why does it need the CTMU to solve it? Because it's conspanding. <laughs> it's basically, the, when you say the metric is changing, you're, you mean that the scale of the whole and its parts are changing with respect to each other. They're, they're changing contravariantly. As the universe gets bigger, the, the parts, the, the little uh, particles and objects embedded in it get smaller relative to the universe. It's this, you know, it's, everything is relative, right? And the size of objects is defined relative to the size of the universe and vice versa. So you've got this relativistic relationship between the whole and its parts. And this contravariance is called conspansion. I'm not understanding how the CTMU solves... Like, firstly, I'm not sure what the problem is. So explain to me once more. What is the problem with saying that the metric is expanding? I understand that there's a problem with saying that the universe is expanding because it implies that it's embedded in something higher. The metric isn't expanding. The metric is, the metric is actually contracting. You're getting, you know, 
You know what co-moving coordinates are. Basically, you start out, if the, as the universe expands, co-moving coordinates actually co-move with the universe itself, right? That, in that sense, the metric is expanding with co-moving coordinates. But our metric is contracting relative to the size of the universe's whole. So you've got to make this distinction. Our metric meaning as tellers, as syntactic operators? It means, means, it means the metric that we use, the scale of distance that we use in the everyday world, okay, that exists between us and the objects that surround us. You understand, right? That comes from Arthur Eddington, you know. He talked about a cosmic observer, you know, things getting smaller and smaller, faster and faster from the point of view of this cosmic observer. That's what it is. You know, I got to give credit to Arthur Eddington for that. He got to it before I did with this cosmic observer thing that he had. You know who Eddington was, right? He was yeah, yeah, yeah. Tested Einstein's general relativity, right? You know, I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit. Now that we're on the topic of how you thought of your theory and how you came up with it quite some time ago, I'm curious, what does the process of coming up with the CTMU look like Practically speaking, do you have a whiteboard? Do you just sit alone with a pipe? Do you bounce it off your wife? Do you go for walks? How are you coming up with the theory? It just sort of comes to you. Sometimes, you know, you start thinking, okay, I'm very good at recognizing paradoxes and inconsistencies. It's just a little thing that I'm good at. And I noticed a lot of paradoxes and inconsistencies from an early age onward in the way people explain things, right? I, I'd ask them for explanations. They wouldn't be able to explain things to my satisfaction. And I, I'd, you know, ask myself, why, why doesn't this appear to make sense? And I would find out that there were certain things that didn't make sense. Then, armed with those paradoxes, I would work on resolving them. And from those resolutions came the CTM. Let's give an example of a paradox that's been resolved by the CTMU. So Newcomb's paradox is one. Do you mind explaining the paradox of Newcomb and then also your solution to it? Well, so that's kind of a long paradox, but basically it's you've got this uh, this predictor who has never been wrong before, and he's got this game that he plays where he sh where he shows you a box with uh, with uh, a thousand dollars in it and tells you that you can take either you know one of these boxes, the opaque box, or you can take both boxes, but if you do not take this transparent box with a thousand dollars in it. I've put a million dollars. I already know what you're going to do. I've put a million dollars in the opaque box, right? But if you try to take both boxes and make that extra thousand dollars that you can see right in front of your face here, if you've done that, I've left this opaque box empty. So you're going to get scuffed. You're going to get your, you know, you're going to get your thousand bucks, and you know you're going to have a nice dinner someplace, and then that's going to be it. All right, that's Newcomb's paradox. Okay, but. Unfortunately, the, the, the subject, the one who is, is running this game on, okay, has two strategies that he has to, that, from which he has to choose. And one of them is, of course, that, well, this predictor has, you know, never been wrong, you know, and, and uh, so therefore, you know, I'd better do that. But the other one says, well, wait a minute. Nobody can actually predict the future. This is some kind of a lucky run that this guy has had. And, uh, you know, I have nothing to lose because that money that he says, He's, he's, he's acting as though he's going to, he's predicted what I've, that money is already in that box one way or another because I'm looking at it. He can't tamper with that box at all. It's already there. So I've got nothing to lose by taking both boxes. So instead of just winning a million dollars, if that's what he put in that box, I'm going to win, you know, one point, you know, zero, a million zero, plus 1,000. Right. One point, you know, zero, zero, one million dollars. And so that's enough. You know, the thousand dollars has enough value that he's going to, take that instead he's going to enrich himself more and thusly increase his utility and of course increasing the utility is the is the whole raison d'etre of economics right and economic theory that's what you're always supposed to do increase your utility so this is it's considered an important paradox because of its applicability to to economics and causation in general is it possible to predict the future well newcomb's demon which is what i call him is analogous to the programmer of a simulation He's already run this simulation in which you think you have free will, but he basically knows what your free will is in advance, right? So he has, you know, that is what has allowed him to do this with the boxes. Gift giving can be tricky. So 
If you're looking for something that lasts far beyond the holiday, then Masterclass has been my go-to. Imagine learning from some of the most influential minds of our time. You have people like Noam Chomsky guiding you through media and critical thinking. You have Bill Nye making science accessible and practical. You even have Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Doris Kearns Goodwin helping us connect with history in ways that actually resonate. Now, Masterclass isn't just another streaming platform. It's about becoming the best version of yourself or helping someone else do the same. Over 200 instructors on topics that you're fervent about or perhaps you're just curious to explore, and the feedback speaks for itself. 88% of Masterclass members say it positively impacts their life. It's also risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're ready to give the gift of unlimited learning, then head to masterclass.com slash theories. That's T H E. O-R-I-E-S. They've got great holiday offers, sometimes up to 50% off. Again, that's masterclass.com slash theories. Okay, so that's the paradox. Now, how does right, the solution and, resolution come in? Well, the resolution is nobody ever placed it in a simulation before. I was the only person to ever place it in a simulation back in 1989 by saying, okay, well, basically now we have to use the idea that reality may be a simulation and that Newcomb's demon is somehow a programmer of this simulation. This was the first application of the simulation hypothesis. Everybody talks about it now, but you'll never see my name mentioned in connection with it. But I was the first person to apply it, at least as far as I know. It could have been somebody else that did so, but I've actually looked and I can't find anything. There as were far as I know, you were the first with self-simulation. Well, and that too. Absolutely. Self-simulation appears, you know, that, that terminology appears in a, in a paper I wrote 20 years ago. So, yeah, that basically I'm Mr. Simulation. Okay? Unfortunately, nobody ever comes to me. They always ask Elon Musk. Why the hell they ask Elon Musk? <laughs> I don't know, you know. Okay, Mr. Moneybags, Elon Musk. And then they, there's another fellow named Nick Boston. Well, I guess is at Oxford or someplace. He's got something called the simulation argument which, you know, is basically a little bit extraneous to the simulation hypothesis, is how likely the simulation hypothesis is to be true on the basis of how humanity has evolved, uh, how certain, uh, how, how shall we say, the, the species that is simulating reality for humanity has evolved. Do they have the technology to do it? Don't they have the technology to do it? That's what Bostrom's Now, how does opposing Newcomb's paradox in the frame of simulation help it it basically tells you that you you might be in a simulation so you better take a very close look at what newcomb's demon has actually succeeded in doing it's got a long arbitrarily long sequence of sequence of correct predictions you'd better give the demon its due and you'd better take just the opaque box that's the only way you're getting your million does that mean that the person being simulated doesn't have free will? No, it does not. Why would it? Just because the demon knows what he's going to choose, that somehow deprives him of free will? Well, see, this is, this is the problem that I had to solve by integrating this into the CTMU. Okay, you actually have a pre-geometric or non-terminal domain in which Newcomb's demon actually exists and in which he actually makes his predictions. You see? So that's that's what it amounts to. You see, How does being in the non-terminal domain and being able to discern what this person's decision is going to be not violate free will for that person? For that person, from their perspective, are you saying they have free will, but from another perspective, they don't have free will? Or no matter what, they have free will from both vantage points? Well, you have free will, period, to the extent that the universe has free will. As I said, the universe is self-composed. All right, you are a component of the universe, therefore you have inherited free will from the universe itself. So, you know, everything, even a quantum particle to some extent has free will or freedom, it has degrees of freedom, right? It's not totally determined. Now, as far as whether, it, from God's point of view, however, God knows, let's just put it this way, let's forget about Newc Newcomb's demon for a second and talk about God, okay? God can see reality as a whole. You know what Einstein's block universe is, right? God sees the universe not as a block. He sees the universe through the eyes of its secondary totals. 
Okay, that's how he's seeing. That's how he's looking and seeing the universe through our eyes, where God's sensor controls, right, which puts a whole different complexion on them. He waits for us to make up our minds before he knows what he's seeing. In other words, what we see is what we've decided on, okay? So God is automatically allowing for our decisions, automatically making room for it. We see what we decide. Can you explain? Everything we decide, you know, if when we decide to uh, commit an event or com commit an act, okay, automatically we know we can see ourselves committing the act. That's that's what I mean. That doesn't mean that we determine everything that's going on around us, right? But God sees that too through our eyes. So it right. doesn't mean that we can see whatever we like. That for example, like if I wished that there was no wall here, then I would see no wall. Does that mean that, or are there limitations on my perception? Well, of course there are. Okay, there is a state of affairs, an external state of affairs that has been created by other tellers. It's not entirely up to you. Okay, so you are constrained in what you can see by the state of the external world. When one does psychedelics, are they operating now? in this geometric pre-info cognition plane? Well, what the psychedelics do is they introduce a gap between the terminal and non-terminal realms and kind of uh, allow you to see things that aren't really in the terminal realm. And that's what those hallucinations are. Okay, you still, still got one foot in the terminal realm, but the psychedelic has kind of, you know, opened up a gap there. And you're sort of in that gap, so you are, there is a certain, there are degrees of freedom in which you can actually uh, perceive, or should I say hallucinate, you see. You have things that you think are perceptions, that seem like per perceptions, but actually there's this this gap that has opened up, and, and you're inhabiting that gap, and that's what, that's what the psychedelics are doing. You know, they're, they've been finding out that they're, you know, basically all chemistry is quantum, and they know, for example, that quantum mechanics is involved in how uh, opiates and morphine, heroin, and things like that affect psychology. This is basically what we're what we're talking about. Psychedelics are doing a little bit of the same thing. When one says hallucinations, usually they mean we're seeing apparitions that aren't actually there. That's not real. Now I know right. that you have a, a qualm with saying that anything is not real. Well, what we well it is. It's mentally real. I mean, the, what I'm saying is, reality is a coupling of mind and and physical reality with non-terminal and non-terminal non-terminal and terminal reality. So therefore there is such a thing as subjective existence. Syntax exists, for example. Any combination of syntax, you can put it together however you want to, and that has mental existence. Is it realized in the terminal realm? Not necessarily. You know, find me a unicorn. There are unary and slash nullary relations. They have two levels, synetic and diffionic. Do you mind explaining that? Well, all relations are syndiphionic. Right? When, when you see two different things, or even when you see yourself, right, you're distributing your own cognition over yourself. Therefore, you've got that synesis and diphionesis. You've got, you've got basically a property and something instantiating the property. Right, that's what that means. You mentioned that there are three ways in which the syndiphionic relationship is self-dual. There are three ways. Now, does it have to be three ways? Does it just happen to be that there are three ways? Or is well, that a necessary there, there are, component for them to exist somehow? Yeah, I'm talking about general symmetries of, of the syndiphionic relationship. You know what a Minkowski diagram is, right? It's got a space axis, a horizontal space axis, and then temporal axes that, that, that are orthogonal to it that go up you know, into the future and past. Uh, and just imagine that you could rotate Minkowski space, right? Well, you can rotate a syndiphionic relation in the same way, right? And and what, because the time axis is ordinal, whereas the, the the space axis is all about arity or the number of things that you're seeing in parallel out in the real world, you're actually making transformations between ordinality and arity in in the relation. And there are uh, other kinds of duality as well. I could probably find more than three if I looked very hard. So, synetic is ordinal, diphionic is arity. No, the the thing, the line, metatime axis that relates one to the other. Okay, that's or okay because you've got levels. You've got you know the property level, and then you've got the instance level. You also mentioned that they're dual because they have an active and a passive interpretation. So, what do you mean by that? 
an active and passive interpretation. Okay, well, 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 we recognize things, but have you ever heard of John Wheeler's observer participation thesis? No. Okay, John Wheeler had this idea called the observer participation thesis, that when we see a quantum event, when we look at a far away star and a photon from that star hits our eye, we are somehow participating in that event. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Basically, you cannot just watch something without actively participating. Okay, you're actually agreeing to it in some way. You're actually actively putting yourself, by perceiving it, you are contributing your perception to it. And because of the nature of TELUS, it's, it's impossible for you to stop yourself from becoming actively entangled with it. Okay, you can't just passively perceive it things okay those things also have you you and the thing that you're observing both have an impact on each other that's the way it has to work because all of these you've got this causal symmetry in the ctmu and in other theories as well so, how would that work on a more mundane level where there's a wall let's say whether i look at the wall or not does that have any bearing to the wall does it exist or not exist when I look? Does it erode more when I look, for example? Yes, you are participating in the existence of the wall. Right. Can the wall not self-perceive? Can it not perceive itself? The, the, ter the tertiary syntactors in the wall can and do perceive each other in a limited way, yes. But in terms of the, in terms of the secondary utility of the wall, you know, what it's actually doing, you know, in the world, you're participating in that. As a matter of fact, you know, human constructed walls wouldn't exist unless they were they were useful to tellers like you. Right? You can't you can't look at anything without participating in its existence. Okay, that's what a measurement event is. When you when you measure the spin of a particle up or down, you are participating in that determination. Okay? That measurement is yours. You're the one who set up the measurement device. You're asking a yes or no question, and your question is being answered. You impose the question on reality, and reality is answering the question for you. So there's this active, passive symmetry in everything. Don't forget to follow Theories of Everything with Kurt Jaimungle on Spotify for exclusive content and in-depth discussions. Your support on Spotify helps us grow and to reach more curious minds like yours. Check out the link in the description and join the Core Toe community on Spotify today. See you there.